You wanna know why Satan hates marriage so much? Because it's the image of God on this earth. That's why. Satan, listen to this, think about this. Satan did not attack Adam until the image of God appeared on the earth. So we're in a series called Blessed Families. Uh, this weekend, I want to talk about the blessed marriage. Marriage is under attack in our country and all over the world. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, there's a statistic. Uh, let me make sure I get it exactly right here. 1930, in 1930, 83% of adult Americans in America were married. Today, 49.7% are married. And I want to show you why Satan hates marriage so much. And I want to show you in Matthew 19 what I believe to be the most in-depth passage on marriage in the Bible. Now, that's saying a lot because most would believe it's Ephesians chapter 5. And I'm not downplaying Ephesians 5. I'm not downplaying that at all. That's an extremely important chapter on marriage. But in Matthew 19, we have a question being asked about marriage and divorce, and Jesus himself gives the answer. Remember, Jesus is God. So this is God's answer about marriage and divorce. I also want to make another statement. Um, if you've experienced a divorce the, uh, in no way, do I ever want you to feel condemnation? No way at all. Uh, I'm going to say something, and I'll say it a little differently than the way you've heard it, and I'll explain it. But for Debbie, there go I. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. The saying and expression is, which I agree with, and I think it's a great expression, is but for the grace of God, there go I. I agree with that, that God's grace has played a huge part in our marriage. I agree with that. But some could hear that who have experienced divorce and say, well, some, this guy said, but for the grace of God, there go I. I would be divorced also. And so they might think, well, where was the grace of God in my situation? You see what I'm saying? And you have to understand that when it comes to marriage, it takes two people. So the reason I'm saying that is yes, but for the grace of God and Debbie, I would be divorced because Debbie uh, could have divorced me on several occasions. I mean, I, 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 I was a jerk. Um, I was a chauvinist. Uh, I verbally abused her in my 20s. I said and did stupid things. Uh, she could have divorced me. So, but for Debbie and the grace of God, I, I, would, be, I would have experienced divorce as well. Are, are y'all following me? So if you've experienced divorce, this is a no condemnation message. But I want to show you what the Bible says about marriage and divorce and how important marriage is in the Bible. And personally, I think most people don't realize how serious God is about marriage. And I want to show you why. He tells us why. In other words, he gives us the reason why marriage is so important. He gives us the reason. And it's God himself. It's, it's in red. I like to say that. It's in red. So it's Jesus talking, all right? So Matthew 19, verse 3. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered, said to them, are you crazy? No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> but that's kind of what he's implying. Here's what he says. Have you not read? In other words, have you never read the Bible yourself? If you'd read the Bible, you wouldn't have even need to ask me this question. Watch. Have you not read that he who made them, them, that's husband and wife, male and female, at the beginning, that's before the fall, before the broken family came in, like I talked about last week, and then it's quotations now because he's quoting Genesis 1, 26 and 27, made them male and female. And he said, 
for this reason. Now, we're going to come back to that because there's a reason why he's talking about marriage and divorce and why uh, God would not have permitted divorce in the beginning. Okay, there's a reason, okay? For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. This word joined is the word you use when you yoke animals together. And by the way, it means equally yoked. That means each person does his share. That's the way, only way marriage works. I heard someone say one time, marriage is 50-50. It's not. It's 100-100. It takes 100% commitment on both parts. Okay. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be equally yoked to his wife, and the two shall become one. Now, I got I to stop again. Do you think that Jesus um, exaggerates? Do you? That shouldn't take you that long to answer that question. <laughs> Do you think he lies? Do you think that he stretches the truth? Jesus said, the two, the two, watch this, the two become one. The two become one. They become one. They become one flesh. Therefore, I remember hearing an old preacher one time, and he said, anytime you see the word therefore, you need to look to see what it's there for. Therefore, what God has joined together, that made one, let not man, that would be the husband as well. This is asking about a husband. Can a husband divorce his wife for any reason? Let not man or any man separate. Okay, this is the answer to the question that they asked. Here's my problem. He go, they, they ask another question, which we're going to read at the moment. And then he answers that question. But a lot of people will give that answer to this question. Are you following me? I don't know if you're how familiar you are with this passage and the teaching of marriage and divorce. But many people will say, will give the next answer as his answer to this question. But that's not his answer to this question. They said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all. And he said, have you not read? Have you not read that when God made them in the beginning, he made them male and female, and a man will leave his father and mother and be joined equally yoked to his wife, and the two will become one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not any person in the world separate that. That's his answer. It's over at that point. That's his answer. Then they ask another question, okay? And then he answers that question. So, but his question right now is, let, let me just sum it up. No. That's his answer. No, it's not. That's what he's saying. No. The two have become one. God's joined them together. Okay? Now watch the next one. They said to him, why then did Moses command, notice this word command, to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away. He, Jesus, said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Not until sin came in this world because of the hardness of your heart. Now listen to me carefully. Please, please hear me again. I've, I've, I've got to speak the truth and please don't think I'm trying to attack someone if they've experienced this. But I will say this, in every divorce, there is at least one person with a hard heart. Sometimes there are two, but most times there's really just one that has a hard heart. And here's what he said. They said Moses commanded commanded to give a certificate of divorce. 
He said, Moses permitted you to put your wife away to divorce your wife uh, if you had a hard heart, men, if you have a hard heart. And here's what, here's what was going on at the time when this, when Moses, when this became a part of the law. Men were marrying other women and neglecting their first wife and abusing her and actually letting other men abuse her and not letting her go free. And so Moses, then it became a part of the law. Moses then made a commandment, give her a certificate of divorce, and maybe another man will treat her like the queen and the princess of God that she really is. That's where this came from. That's where this was came from, okay? So I want you to notice something, by the way. Moses, in biblical language, biblical interpretation, hermeneutics, exegesis, all those words I love, okay, Moses represents the law, and Jesus represents grace. Let, let me show you the verse. So, you know, John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. Okay, here's my point. Jesus said, they said, is it lawful? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus said, no, it's not. They said, well, Moses said you could. He said, uh-huh, under the law, you can. Okay, listen. We would think it's the opposite. We would think that the law said you're not supposed to divorce and that grace says it's okay. Are y'all following me? That, this is so much better than your, your, you should just be going, oh, 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 oh. this is the most amazing thing I've ever heard. Okay. We would think that the law says, no, you can't do that, but grace says, hey, listen, you're under grace, it's okay. No, it's the opposite. Grace says, no, you're in a covenant and you work it out. Law says, yeah, you got a hard heart, so just let her go. Are, are y'all following? <laughs> this is Jesus. Okay, so why? Why? Okay, so Jesus said these three words. Have you not read that in the beginning God made them male and female? And then he makes the statement, for this reason. Okay, what reason? What reason? Well, you got to go back to Genesis 126, but I'm going to tell you the reason, okay? So there are three things about a blessed marriage you need to know, okay? Number one, marriage represents God. Marriage represents God on this earth. So back in uh, that Matthew 19 again, and he answered and said, have you not read that he who made them the game made them male or female for this reason? Man shall his father and mother be joined. Okay, so now we got to go back to Genesis 1. Okay. Then God said, verse 26, let us make man. Is us singular or plural? Plural. So three in one. Let us make man, man, and that word, remember, is Adam, which means mankind. Let us make mankind, not male. Not, no, he didn't say let us make male in our image. He said let us make mankind, male and female. Let us, let us make mankind in our image, ours plural, according to our plural likeness, and let them, plural, male and female, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, every creeping thing creeps on the earth. So God created mankind, again, that's the word here in the Hebrew, mankind, in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Hear me. Male and female is the image of God. But not just any man or any woman, a husband and a wife. Because Adam and Eve weren't living in sin. Okay, We know that. The sin was eating from the tree they weren't supposed to. The other stuff they were doing was fun. <clears throat> but that wasn't sin. Okay, Because they were married. So when God wanted to create a portrait of himself on this earth, he created the marriage. That's what you got to understand. God said, let's put our image, our likeness on the earth. And he put a married couple. That, that is the image of God, okay? Marriage is the image of God. Listen, male is not the image of God. And all the women can say, praise God. Male is not the image of God. Male and female is the image of God. A marriage is God. You want to know why Satan hates marriage so much? Because it's the image of God on this earth. 
That's why. Satan, listen to this. Think about this. Satan did not attack Adam. He did not attack until the image of God appeared on the earth. That's when he got scared. He wasn't scared of man by himself. He was scared when God showed up. When he looked at God, he saw the image of God, but he didn't see it in Adam. He saw it in Adam and Eve. Are are y'all following me? This is phenomenal. That's when he got mad. Okay, so God is a triune God. I know that's a theological word, but what that means is three in one. Let me show you again this little illustration. Okay, God is three, watch this, three in one. In other words, you can look at God and you see God, he's one, but if you look closely, you'll see three persons, right? Okay, but now some people say, well now, if he created male and female and that's his image, his image is three in one, but marriage is two in one. That's where you're completely missing it because marriage is a husband, a wife, and God. That is the blessed marriage. That is the blessed marriage. And that's the only way marriage works. Three in one. And you get three in one, and hell can't stand against you. You make sure God's in your marriage. So marriage is the image of God on this earth. Here's number two. Marriage represents Christ and the church. This is why marriage is so important. It represents Christ's church. Okay, here's the Ephesians 5 passage. Watch what three words it starts with, and watch what verse it again quotes from Genesis, Ephesians 5, verse 31, for this reason. In other words, that we're the image bearers of God on the earth. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, glued to his wife. He's not glued to his parents anymore. He's glued to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife, now this is talking to the men, as himself, and now talking to the women, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So the two of you together are representing the Trinity, but as a, as a couple now, or as a, a man or a woman, as a man, you're representing Christ. And as a woman, you're representing the church. So again, let's talk about now lost, someone lost. You're trying to win them to the Lord. So you're trying to win a guy, let's say husbands, I'll start with you. Then ladies, I'll get to you. Husbands, I'll start with you. Let's say that you're trying to win Joe to the Lord. And so Joe says to you, well, if I give my life to the Lord, what's my life going to be like after I give my life to the Lord? And what, How is God going to treat me if I give him control of my life? This is your answer. Well, you know the way I treat my wife? God is going to treat you just like I treat my wife. Would you like to be saved? (laughs) Yeah, let's get honest. What would Joe say? Uh, God's going to treat me like you treat your wife? I I don't want to be saved. I don't want to be laughed at. I don't want to be put down. I don't want to be made fun of. I don't want to be talked about behind my back. And I don't want to be ordered around. And we're going to talk about servant leadership. But sir, if that's what you think marriage is, you're a horrible example of Jesus. And sometimes I just say things just straight out, don't I? I just It even surprises me. I think, well, you just said that kind of straight up there. But what Joe should say is, you mean I'm going to be loved, and I'm going to be honored, and I'm going to be treated like royalty? Yes, I want to accept Jesus Christ. If if Jesus treats me like you treat your wife, I'd love to be saved. See, we represent Christ. Okay, ladies, it's your turn. (laughs) So let's say you're talking to another lady, and she says, you know, um, I don't really know how to pray. I don't know how to talk to the Lord. And so you say, well, let me use the example in Scripture. If you want to know how to talk to the Lord, you talk to the Lord the same way that I talk to my husband. (laughs) 
what's she going to say? You mean I can cuss him out? <laughs> you mean I can be disrespectful? You mean I can talk about his weaknesses to everybody else? Please hear me. Marriage is a lot more important than you think. This is why Jesus got upset when they said, is it okay to divorce? You know what he was thinking? Would it be okay for the Trinity to divorce? Have you not read that you represent us on this earth? That, and you not only represent the Trinity, you represent me and the church. So what Ephesians 5 says, marriage, a husband and wife represents Christ and the church. Third thing marriage represents, marriage represents covenant. Covenant. Do you, are you catching how important marriage is to God? It rep, it's his image on the earth. It represents Christ and the church, and it represents covenant. In Malachi, he's telling them why he's not accepting their offerings. The first reason, by the way, is their family. Their family's out of order. Actually, their faith is out of order. The second reason is their family, and the third reason is their finances. That's where we get into the part of tithing. But this, this is the family part. So he's telling them, I'm not receiving your, your worship or your offerings. And they said, Malachi 2.14, yet you say, for what reason? It's amazing that the other two passages also begin with, for this reason. Now they're saying, for what reason are you not accepting our offerings? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you've dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and the wife and your wife by covenant. Pastor Jimmy Evans does one of the best teachings in the world on the difference between a covenant and a contract. And let me just stick it up here for you. In a contract, we protect our rights and we limit our responsibilities. Think about if you're buying a house or you're entering into a business agreement, in a contract, you're trying to protect your rights, right? And you're trying to limit your responsibilities. A covenant is just the opposite. In a covenant, we give up our rights and we pick up our responsibilities. And this is the example to the world. See, see again, if a lost person says, how do I know that God will keep his word to me? You know what you should say? You should say, look at how my wife and I have kept our word. Because, see, we entered into a covenant too. And by the way, let me just remind you of the covenant that you entered into if you're married. For richer or for poorer. In sickness and in health. Here's one. For better. What? Because <laughs> I've done a lot of marriage counseling. People say, well, it's really gotten bad. Uh-huh. That's what you signed up for. And then you just couldn't shut up. You went on and said, till death do us part. <laughs> That's the coming unit. Okay. But it is an example. It is uh, uh, um, an example, I guess you say, of the new covenant, not the old covenant. God said, I'm going to love you. I'm going to protect you, provide for you, bless you. I'm going to be your father. That's my part. Your part is... You know what, um, son, son, would you come over here, Jesus? Would you come here? And the son walks over. And the Lord says, uh, Jesus, this is Robert. Robert's not going to be able to keep the covenant. So, son, I was wondering if you would go to the earth and if you would fulfill the covenant for Robert. And you'd live the life that he can't live. And I also need you to die the death that he should die. And Jesus said, okay, I'll do it. And then the father said to me, do you believe that Jesus lived the life that you couldn't live and he died the death that you should have died? And in a motel room when I was 19 years old, I said, yes, I believe it. And the father said, you're in the covenant now. And you're my son 
and I will never leave you nor forsake you. Never. Never. That's what marriage is. Listen, that even if my spouse doesn't keep her end of the covenant, I'll keep my end of it. That's marriage. And we're telling the world, this is what God's like. He is a covenant-keeping God. That is why Satan hates marriage. Because it's the image of God on this earth. It represents Christ in the church. And it represents the new covenant. Some of the greatest words in the Bible. A promise from Jesus himself. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And maybe you needed to hear that today. Maybe you are in a difficult marriage, or maybe you're in a good marriage, but you know that God wants to take you farther in your marriage. And I'm praying for that for you today. I'm praying that God will bless your marriage so that your marriage can represent Jesus on this earth. Hey, thanks so much for watching. I'm gonna continue this series next time.